Welcome to the Trinity Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Tim, and we are glad that you are worshiping with us today. Welcome to the church scattered throughout Northeast Tarrant County and beyond. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Before we get started today, just a couple quick announcements. First, uh, if you uh, can find it on the worship page, the online worship page that linked to the video you're now watching, there's a number of resources uh, for children, for students, for adults to help you with worship, to help you grow deeper. At the bottom of that page, there's a connection card form so that you can let us know how we can be praying together so that you can let us know that you're worshiping with us today. I would call all of those to your attention uh, and it would be great if you could fill those things out and use those resources uh, so that we can be growing deeper in this season. Additionally, I just wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, come Monday, we're going to be sending out a lot of information. We're going to be making some changes to worship. We're still going to be worshiping online, but we're going to have some new things as well. So look for an email via the e-news on Monday to tell you more about all of that. And with that, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. I'm Meredith Golden, and I'm grateful to be worshiping with you today. Please join me in the call to worship from Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let us worship God.
Friends, it is because the Lord is gracious and compassionate. It is because God is full of grace and mercy that we can come before God and confess our sins. So if you would join me in the prayer of confession. God of grace, we confess that we have elevated the things of this world above you. We have made idols of possessions and people and used your name for causes that are not consistent with you and your purposes. We have permitted our schedules to come first and have not taken the time to worship you. We have not always honored those who guided us in life. We have participated in systems that take life instead of give it. We have been unfaithful in our covenant relationships. Forgive us and hear us as we continue to confess in the silence of our hearts. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. It comes from Galatians chapter 5. It says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Friends, the good news of the gospel is that we have been saved. We have been set free. So be at peace. And now let us continue in our worship.
Friends, drawn together by the compassion of God, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. We'll respond to each petition with the words, Save us from all of our troubles. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for all those who minister in your church. Give us now, we pray, pastors, deacons, elders, teachers, and lay leaders, who will guide your people in the way of truth. Bless your whole church during this time. Hear our prayer, O God. Save us from all of our troubles. God of the earth, we praise you for your wondrous creation. Nurture our green spaces and national parks. Send rain where there is drought. Protect the lands and waters where we abuse them. Show us how to care for your earth and its creatures. Hear our prayer, O God. Save us from our troubles. Aware of disorder around the world, O God, we pray, that wars and armed terror terrorism cease, that violent extremism everywhere be calmed, that governments meet the needs of their poorest residents, and that the days before and after our election this week be peaceful, that all prejudice be rejected. Hear our prayer, O God. Save us from all our troubles. God, our healer, come to our aid as COVID-19 continues to spread and spike, and as hospitaliz hospitalizations now rise abruptly throughout all 50 states. We pray for the families of the 18,000 Texans who have died and for the 229,000 Americans who have died. Heal those who are currently sick, protect families and friends from being infected, support those in public health and all medical services, and strengthen our resolve, Lord, to eradicate all diseases, including malaria, dengue, HIV and AIDS, and so many others. Show us your mercy. Hear our prayer, O oh God. Save us from all our troubles. We also lift up to you, O oh God, all the faithful who have suffered throughout the year in body, mind, or spirit. We pray especially for all those loved ones we have lost this year. We thank you for their lives lived in faith, who now live in you. And at this time, we pray for all those we name before you in the silence of our hearts. Amen. And now, in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we pray the words your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us continue in our worship. If you would join me in prayer. Gracious God, we ask that you would speak to us today. Give us ears that hear, eyes that see, and hearts and minds that can be changed so that we can follow you better. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. The cowbird is unique to North America. While some other birds occasionally lay their eggs in other birds' nests, the cowbird does so exclusively. In Illinois, for example, the little brown cowbird with its mink-colored head is a common sight, but bird experts say you will not find one cowbird nest in the entire state. And that's becoming a problem, says writer Peter Kendall. The cowbirds are prodigious egg layers. Each female commonly deposits 20 to 40 eggs in dozens of other nests each spring. Cowbird eggs usually hatch more quickly than other birds' eggs, and the chicks grow more quickly as well. 
Because birds tend to feed the largest and loudest of their young first, because that usually means they're the most healthy and have the best chance of survival, the host bird spends an inordinate amount of time and energy tending to the cowbird. As a result, the cowbird is pushing some other songbirds to extinction. Now, you may be asking, and it's a good question, what does this have to do with a sermon and or our lives? And I'll tell you. You see, the problem that these other birds are facing because of these cowbird eggs is the problem of distraction. The problem is that distraction always have a way of pushing out of our lives that which is most important. More to the point, I think that we as a people, as Christians, have become distracted. I think we are distracted by the coronavirus. I think we are distracted by the election. I think we are distracted by civil unrest, by the economy, by almost everything at this point. And because of that, we've taken our eyes off the prize. We've lost our way. We've forgotten our God. And hear me on this. It's not that all of those other things aren't important. They are important. It's just that they're not the most important thing. And yet they all ring so loudly in our ears. So much so that I think we have trouble hearing the still small voice of God. Somehow we have forgotten that regardless of what happens over the next few days with the election coming or the next few months with the virus, or the next few years with the world being as it is right now. The truth is that we know that our God is still sovereign. The truth that we know is that our God will still be with us. And the truth that we know is that our God still invites us to live today in His kingdom come. And it's because we know this We should live out a different ethos in the world. We should be a different kind of people. But let me back up for a minute. Today we continue our new series exploring Jesus' image of the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And he seemed to understand and even see this as a different reality all around us. Uh, It was a different way to live, a different mindset to believe, a different hope to have in the midst of this place, right here and right now. It was a world with a different ethic, a different ecology, a different economy, a different reality from what we see all around us. Of course, what really makes a kingdom distinct is the king, the queen, their rule, their reign, their views, their purposes— And then, of course, how well we follow. Of course, that is our challenge, isn't it? We can live in the kingdom of the world or we can live in the kingdom of God here and now, but it all depends on who we follow. Who is our king? As we follow God, as we live out our faith, as we love and serve and forgive others, we are bringing God's kingdom here. We are becoming the kingdom of God. We are bearing this kingdom into the world. We are demonstrating God's kingdom come. But therefore it matters which king we follow. Therefore, who we follow will determine how we live. The kingdom through which we see the world will determine who we become. And the problem is that we often mistakenly follow the kings of this world, the king of self, the king of culture, the king of convenience, the king of worry, the king of wealth, the kings of this world and this age. But as we do, we are living in the wrong direction. We are worshiping the wrong kings. We are bringing the wrong kingdom. And as we'll see today, the really scary part is that sometimes we don't even realize it. 
We can think of ourselves as good and faithful and yet not be living the goodness of the kingdom of God. So let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 through chapter 22, verse 22. As Jesus continues to teach us about the kingdom of God. In today's passage, we're going to also see Jesus make a bunch of comparisons. Two sons, two kinds of tenant, two kinds of guest, and ultimately two authorities. So let's read Matthew chapter 21, verse 28. Matthew 21, 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you, The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet." But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told his attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, 
but few are chosen. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Amen. Four seemingly independent vignettes, three of which reference the kingdom of heaven, one that doesn't, and yet maybe there's a thread that runs through all of them and ties them all together. And who knows, maybe there's something there for us as well. So let's look back at these three stories, the sons, the tenants, and the guests, before we then wrap it up with this idea of authority and see what it has to teach us about the kingdom of God. More to the point, let's look at how the characters become distracted by priorities and plans, distracted by prosperity and prestige, distracted by politics and power. And then let's see how the kingdom rescues us from these perspectives as we remember that humble and faithful obedience matters. And we begin with the parable of these two sons. Uh, right from the start, you may notice that this story has some similarities with the parable of the prodigal son. One son that says the wrong thing but then returns back to the father. One son that says the right thing, but remains distant from the father. And clearly, neither of these sons are quite the ideal, uh, a child both obedient in speech and action. One says the right thing, but doesn't do the right thing. The other says the wrong thing, but then does the right thing. Somehow both of these kids are forgetting that this father is in charge. They are choosing to serve themselves, choose their own priorities, their own plans ahead of the father's. And this can be tricky because the first son looks and sounds and even seems so obedient, appears to be a good kid, but then his actions or lack thereof betray him. And remember, Jesus is telling this story for a purpose. He's hoping that his listeners feel some tension here. We can say the right things, look the part, even know the right things, and yet still be distant from the Father, be disobedient to God the Father. The second son is disobedient in a different way. The second son is confrontational, even defiant in his words, and then later comes around and repents and does what he's supposed to do. Jesus asks, which of these sons did what the father wanted? Clearly, it's the second son, the one who actually did the work. And Jesus' point is relatively simple. Obedience matters. Faithfulness matters. Repentance matters. Following God matters. Be careful not to be distracted by all our own priorities and plans because they keep us sometimes from the Father. Because they keep us from living as kingdom people. But let's keep going. Jesus then tells the story of some bad tenants. A landowner planted a vineyard, digs the press, adds all the amenities and accoutrements you could want, then he moves away. And he rents out the vineyard to some farmers. The idea here is that these new tenants would work the vineyard and keep some amount of the crop for themselves. The rest of the proceeds, the rest of the fruit, would go to the landowner. 
Come harvest time, the landowner sends some servants to collect what's his, his portion of the harvest. He sends servants, but the tenants seize them, beat them, and even kill some of them. So the landowner sends some more servants. The same thing happens to this second group. Ultimately, the landowner sends his own son. And they do the same thing. At this point, obviously, the owner is no longer concerned about his portion of the proceeds. He's concerned about justice. He's concerned about the removal and destruction of these evil tenants. But backing up for a moment, where did these tenants go wrong? What did they forget? How did they become so distracted? They were doing the work, they were caring for the vineyard, and then something changed. In some ways, they became distracted by prosperity, by prestige. They wanted the vineyard, they wanted to be owners, they wanted to be in charge. And then they mistakenly thought that if they were strong enough, if they could hold on to the vineyard, it would be theirs. Of course, this is very kingdom of the world thinking. More importantly, it means that they forgot their role as stewards. They forgot that this wasn't their vineyard in the first place. Here again in this passage, Jesus is reminding his listeners that it is so easy to become distracted by the lures of prestige and prosperity. We can forget that we are actually called to be stewards of God's kingdom, of what God has given us. God has made us responsible for what he has blessed us with, and we are to work on it, work on it well, work on it reliably, but also remember that it's his. What's more, Jesus is using this story to especially poke some of the leaders of the people at this time who have grown comfortable in their prosperity and in their prestige, forgetting that they are placed over God's vineyard, not their own. Jesus reminds us all that we have been called to be good stewards of what is his. As such, we are to produce good fruit. Which brings us to the third story. Uh, the king is throwing a wedding banquet for his son. And so he sends out the save the dates, the invitations, the RSVPs. And as far as we know, everyone says that they're going to come. Because this is the king, this is the prince. Of course they'll be there. What's more, we can imagine the type of people that the king would have invited. The royal, the wealthy, the powerful, the privileged, the important. This would have been a who's who in the kingdom. And they're all ready to come. Until, that is, the king sends word that now the party is ready. Today's the day. Now is the time. Come on in. And then all of a sudden, everyone starts to come up with excuses. Actually, I've something I need to do. Actually, a, a work thing came up. Actually, I'm a little bit busy with this thing. Actually, I mean, I didn't schedule this, but something actually landed on that same day. I'm so sorry. Actually, I'm not going to make it after all. And in this honor-based culture, this isn't just an oversight or an annoyance. This isn't neutral. This is a slap in the face to the king. Because, of course, the message that you're sending is that this other event is more important than your event. This other thing that came up is more important than you. My priorities are more important than your son. And again, the sense we get is that these guests have said that they're coming, and now they're not. Just like the tenants who said they'd pay and now don't. Just like the first son who said he would do the work and then didn't. But then they end up being disobedient, being dishonest, as if there won't be consequences. Except remember, this reflects badly upon the king. It looks bad if you throw a big party and no one comes. Well, the king isn't done yet. 
He tells his servants to go get other people and bring them in, anyone, everyone, bring them in so that my party is full. And the servants do. They bring in others, and the party seems to be going well. The king makes his entrance, but as he does, he discovers someone disrespectfully is not wearing the appropriate attire. Just as an aside, commentators actually are a little bit mixed here, uh, but the point is the same either way. Some commentators think that the king would have provided wedding clothes to all the guests, and so this guest is simply not putting on what was given to them. Other commentators say that wedding clothes are simply clothes that are clean, in which case this guest didn't put on clean clothes. Again, didn't respect the king enough to do what was proper. Either way, the point is the same. This guest didn't respect the king. And even then, you notice that the king gives the person the benefit of the doubt, asks politely, friend, why aren't you wearing what you're supposed to be? And when this guest doesn't answer, doesn't have the respect to answer the king's question, the king deals with him. But again, this wasn't an accidental slip. This wasn't about being not wealthy enough to actually wear the appropriate or have the appropriate attire. This was an intentional slight, if not slap. And so we're not surprised by the king's response. This guest and all those who didn't come were distracted by politics or power. The only reason you don't go to the king's party when you said you would is that you're either playing politics or seeking power. And either way, you aren't serving the king. More to the point, you've forgotten the king. These guests were jockeying for power, trying to create a place for themselves, and in so doing, they weren't being faithfully obedient to the king. In some ways, that's the end of this section. And yet, if we go just a little bit farther, Jesus brings a bit more clarity to all of this. Because these parables have been aiming at, among others, the religious leaders at that time. And so predictably, after all of this, they're a little upset. So they get some reinforcements, and then they try and trap Jesus. And the trap is simple enough, though devious and difficult to escape. Should we pay imperial taxes to Caesar or not? And remember, at that time, ancient Palestine was a colonized satellite of Roman imperial power. As tends to be the case, the people don't like Roman oversight. Turns out being taxed by someone far away without at least representation has never been something all that fun. Then to make matters worse, the Caesars tended to understand themselves as basically gods, uh, worthy of veneration, worthy of worship. And so paying tribute to Caesar would be a lot like worshiping a false god, giving offerings to a false god, which wouldn't have just been unsavory, it would have been idolatrous. And there's the trap. If Jesus says he is for paying Roman taxes, then he's an idolater. Then he doesn't love God. Then people will think him a coward or a traitor or worse, and the Jewish leaders will be vindicated. On the other hand, if Jesus says he's against paying Roman taxes, then he becomes Rome's problem. He's a revolutionary. He's an insurgent. He's trouble. And the Jewish leaders simply need to point the civil authorities and have them take care of the problem. It's a good trap. Neither answer will work. But then in one of the deftest answers in all of Scripture, Jesus asks, whose picture is on the coin? Well, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And the people are stunned, and they clear away. But for us, look at how this also manages to pull this thread all the way through our stories today. Because the reality is, the, the idea that we've been talking about is you're living in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of this world. And really, it's a question of loyalty. Which are you loyal to? 
And the problem is the, kings, the kingdom of this world is what gives us all of these distractions. My own priorities, my own plans, prosperity, prestige, politics, power. Those are all things that are important in the kingdom of this world, not necessarily in the kingdom of heaven. And therefore they become distractions. And somehow Jesus is able to see through their trap and recognize, no, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but give to God what's God's. Somehow Jesus is able to see the kingdom of heaven all around us. And it's a question then for us. Of which kingdom are we a part of? Which kingdom do we live in? Which king do we follow? But we have to see the world differently. We have to be obedient to our king. And yet this is also what helps us to live differently. We work faithfully, we bear fruit, we steward well, we respond and follow our king. And as we do, we help bring God's kingdom come. If you would join me in prayer. Gracious God, you know how distracted we have become by our own priorities and plans, by prosperity, prestige, politics, power. Lord, it's so easy for us to forget you. It's so easy for us to forget the kingdom of God. And so we ask and pray that you would help us, that you would remind us, that you would change the way we see the world. Give us new eyes. Give us new ears. Give us new minds and hearts that we might recognize how we can live in the kingdom of God and be a part of the kingdom of God and bring the kingdom of God more here such that your will is done, not just in heaven, but on earth as well. Lord, help us to seek your kingdom first, your righteousness first. Help us follow you today and always. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, let us continue in our worship. As we move into a time of offering, let us consider the word of God in Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. This verse reminds us that where we are does not change whose we are, and it does not change the people we are called to be. We are the Lord's, and all that we have belongs to him. May we know this truth deeply and live our lives accordingly. Let us pray. We are not our own, we belong to you. You have created us and given us life anew. O oh God, our creator, savior, and sustainer, we extend our arms and open our hands to present our offerings to you. We make these gestures to display outwardly our hearts overflowing gratitude for all your gifts. 
Receive these gifts from us, O triune God, and through them bring life and hope to many. In the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. And so at this time, let us give of our tithes and offerings to God. Now, friends, let us affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we continue with our worship. You have poured out grace and brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. You give with mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sin. Your promise. 
Friends, as we close in worship, just a few announcements. First, we've kicked off our stewardship campaign. You should have received a letter by now in the mail, and if not, you can find more information on our website. You can also expect to receive another letter in the mail sometime this week. During this time um, of stewardship, we ask that you just prayerfully consider what gifts you're able to respond with and what uh, you can contribute to the work of the church. Secondly, on Sunday evening, we will have our continuation of our monthly Zoom communion services. So you, you can join us on Sunday evening for a Zoom communion service. Uh, that information will also be on the website. Finally, uh, all of our services that we've been doing at the church, the information for those can be found in our e-news and on the website, and there'll be a big announcement made about um, the future of our worship services made on Monday. And with that, receive the benediction. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. God's blessings be upon you today and forever. Amen.